Welcome back guys to my countdown of my top 100 favourite films of the decade. This video I'm going to be looking at the films that place between positions 90 and 81. Let's go! Okay, so next on the list we have John Krasinski's A Quiet Place. This is one of those films that the more time I've had to distance myself from it, the more I've grown to appreciate it. The reason it makes an appearance on my top 100 is because A Quiet Place is what I like to call an experience film. And by that I mean, when I watched it, I hadn't experienced anything like it before. It was unique. But A Quiet Place earns its spot on the list because it's the only film that I can remember sitting through with an audience and for the entire duration, not a single person in the audience made a noise. The atmosphere in the room you could cut it with a knife. When a film's premise and atmosphere can consequentially make an audience change their behavior whilst they're watching, that is a marvelous accomplishment. The plot of A Quiet Place is centered around this family who are living in the midst of an apocalyptic situation where aliens have invaded. These aliens don't have any eyesight, but they hunt using sound. So if somebody makes a sound, then you're dead. So the only way to survive in this film is to not make any noise. John Krasinski has done an incredible job of directing. This film is so tightly wound that even the sound of a pin dropping is deafening. He also gets remarkable performances out of not only himself, but his kids in the film, as well as his his real life wife, Emily Blunt. It just goes to show that real actors don't need dialogue in order to give profoundly intense and captivating performances. This film surprised me and got me to shut up for an hour and a half. That's some kind of record for me. Right then, at number 89, we have Danny Boyle's 127 Hours. This film tells the true life story of thrill seeker Aaron Ralston, who's played in this film by James Franco, who got his arm pinned between a boulder and a canyon wall. He spent five days in this crevice trying to figure out how he was going to survive. Nobody knew that he was missing and with time and water running out, he had to resort to amputating his own arm. This film is so gripping. It's essentially a one-man show from James Franco who gives a powerhouse performance as Aaron. The scene where he amputates his own arm? Nah. I wanted to watch, but at the same time, it was so difficult to. I just remember the noises as he was like plucking at the nerves in his arm. It was this jangling, loud noise. It was so uncomfortable. But the film is uplifting because it's ultimately about one man's determination to survive. It's supremely well shot and performed and very cathartic. So next up is a film that critics hated but audiences couldn't get enough of and it's the musical biography about P.T. Barnum, The Greatest Showman. Whoa! Directed by Michael Gracie, The Greatest Showman is one hell of a crowd pleaser. Yes, I am very aware of how glossy this film is, historically speaking, but at the end of the day, I go to movies to be entertained, and I sure as hell loved this showstopper of a film. This is the rare original musical where almost every song in the soundtrack has longevity. The choreography, the set pieces, and the costumes are all fabulous. You guys might not know this, but The Greatest Showman actually did terribly on its first week of release. Critics trashed it, but the word of mouth hype and the radio play that this film got slowly spread like wildfire, and then it went on to make over $400 million worldwide. It became critic-proof because audiences loved it so much. The Greatest Showman might be fluffy escapism, but it turns out it was what we needed. Like how Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers gave comfort to the people of the 1930s during the Great Depression, The Greatest Showman was the all-singing, all-dancing, perfectly timed movie that we needed to uplift our spirits. This film has left its mark on the zeitgeist as a pop cultural phenomenon. Okay, so next on the list we have Jordan Peele's sophomore feature film, the poignant and thought-provoking horror, Us. After the humongous success of his debut film, Get Out, there was a lot of anticipation to see if Peele could deliver something as riveting as Get Out. Turns out, Jordan Peele's just getting started. Us tells the story of the Wilson family, a privileged African-American family who on a trip to Santa Cruz are terrorized by four individuals who turn out to be exact doppelgangers of themselves. Jordan Peele's signature blend of horror, humor, and introspection are all present in Us. We live in a world now where we're all too quick to point the finger and place blame on someone else. There's so much emphasis on vilifying the other that we don't actually realize that we ourselves are the problem. Us is Jordan Peele's Black Mirror. He is showing us our ugly reflection. Us also demonstrates the confidence that Jordan Peele had gained since the success of Get Out. His artistic choices as a director in Us are far more bold. They carry a lot more symbolism and connotations of ideas of class, socialization, as well as the duality of our shadow selves. Lupita Nyong'o delivers not one, but two stupendously good performances in this movie as the Wilson matriarch Adelaide, as well as her guttural, chilling doppelganger Red, 
a performance which has made cameos in my nightmares, no kidding. For me, it wasn't as tidy as Get Out, but it is still an exceptionally intelligent and thrilling follow-up from Jordan Peele, and it begs to be rewatched. Next up is a film which is essentially cinematic depression, and it's Kenneth Onigan's Manchester by the Sea. This film is bleak. All of its characters are broken people dealing with tragedy, None more so than the film's protagonist, Lee Chandler, who's playing this film by Casey Affleck, who, after learning his brother has died from heart disease, has to travel back to his hometown of Manchester by the Sea, where he learns that he has inherited the guardianship of his nephew Patrick, who's playing this film by Lucas Hedges, and this is a responsibility that he doesn't want. But also him returning to his hometown forces him to face the demons of his past. This movie is an absolute downer because it's all about loss, grief and pain, but Lonergan's script is so masterfully written, it's a film which just envelops you. Casey Affleck delivers an astonishing performance as Lee. It's not a, hey, look at me, I'm acting performance. It's not very grabby. It's an incredibly subdued and withdrawn performance where his hunched posture, his quiet demeanor, his body language, it speaks volumes to his past trauma. The writing is also phenomenal. It doesn't feel like dialogue. It just feels like everyday conversation. It's remarkable how Lonergan manages to capture this. Manchester by the Sea somehow manages to be beautiful and ugly simultaneously, both in the topics and themes that it addresses, but also in the way that Lonergan shoots it. But it also has a cathartic message about forgiving yourself. It's a truly dignified film which left me floored. Okay, so next up we have a gritty thriller from a director who has exploded into popularity over the last decade with intelligent films such as Sicario, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049. But his first film on the list is the 2013 film Prisoners. Prisoners tells the story of two families who are neighbors and friends. They are the Dovers, who are played by Hugh Jackman and Maria Bella, and the Birches, who are played by Terence Howard and Viola Davis. Each family has a daughter roughly around the same age, and one evening, both the daughters are abducted. Detective Loki, who's played by Jake Gyllenhaal, is on the case, but when developments start to go dry, the patriarch of the Dover family, Keller, who's played by Hugh Jackman, decides to take matters into his own hands to find his daughter and her friend by any means necessary. This was such a gripping thriller. Aaron Guzikowski did a great job of writing a screenplay which constantly feels like it's building. The stakes feel so high. He also did a great job of blurring the lines between good and evil with all of the characters. The actions of the sympathetic father figure, Keller, are morally abhorrent, but are they justified? In one scene, he tortures a mentally ill loner played by Paul Dano in order to get information out of him. It's distressing to watch, but it illustrates just how far people will go to retrieve their loved ones. The acting in this film is top tier. Hugh Jackman is a hot ball of rage, but never does it feel like he's chewing the scenery. I also love how this film ended because it comes full circle and it's a bit devastating, a little bit of a cliffhanger, but it's kind of perfect. It just left me stunned. Right, so next up we have part two of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. I do think that part two is a stronger film than part one, mainly because part one is mostly set up, but part two is the showdown that we had been waiting for. As it was prophesized, only one may live. Harry or Voldemort? This had been building for the last four films and by Merlin's beard was it satisfying. The battle at Hogwarts is epic but intimate. It's army versus army and within the grounds of Hogwarts there are all these awesome moments, too many to list, but some of my favorites include Minerva versus Snape, Neville killing Nagini like a boss, the showdown between Molly Weasley and Bellatrix Lestrange with this iconic line. Not my daughter, you bitch. Oh my God, I love it. The moment Hermione and Ron's sexual tension finally erupted with a kiss. The final duel, of course, between Harry and Voldemort, but the bit that always gets me blubbing is where Snape dies, and it's revealed that he loved Lily Potter all along. And then there's that bit, you know, where he says, Oh, Loved in my throat. I, like many, grew up with Harry Potter and it was wonderful seeing the finale of this franchise end on such a satisfying note. So next on the countdown is the compelling mother-son drama from director Lenny Abrahamson, and it is Room. Adapted from the novel by Emma Donoghue, by Donoghue herself, Room tells the story of Joy and Jack, a mother and son who are playing this film by Brie Larson and Jacob Tremblay, who have spent seven and five years respectively in this 12 foot by 12 foot room, which their captain Nick has kept them in. The film is told from the point of view of five-year-old Jack, who has never been anywhere but Room. He was born in 
room. Room is his will. From Jack's perspective, room almost seems beautiful and homely, but Joy is determined to break free and show Jack the big wide world that lies beyond room. Room is a film which is quite unique. It's a film which is constantly in flux where every shot is juxtaposed in some sense. The room is simultaneously a home to Jack, but a prison to Joy. The scenario is a nightmare, but it feels safe and hopeful. The tone is one of childhood wonderment, but the surroundings are dank and grim. Normally, if I say a film's elements are at odds with each other, it usually means that there's an issue with it, but in Room, it's a finely tuned balance, mostly due to the exceptional score by Stephen Rennix, as well as the clever cinematography by Danny Cohen, who makes the confines of Room feel vast as well as claustrophobic. But what truly makes the movie so enthralling is the performances from Brie Larson and Jacob Tremblay. Together, they are astounding. Their connection as mother-son feels authentic, and Larson and Tremblay deliver raw and truthful performances. It is a remarkable film. Okay, so next up we have A Tender Tale of Forbidden Love with Todd Haynes' adaptation of Patricia Highsmith's novel, The Price of Salt, and it is Carol. With an electrifying pairing of Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara as lesbian lovers in 1950s America, this romantic drama is surging with passion. Haynes' craftsmanship for this film is exquisite. Everything works in harmony together. The production design and Sandy Powell's costumes immediately convince you that this is the 1950s. The grainy 16mm also texturizes the film, making it feel more period. The melancholy score by Carter Burwell is sensually evocative. The cinematography by Edward Lackman possesses the linger of desire. It captures that feeling of infatuation and attraction. And of course, Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara are utterly brilliant together. I loved Kate Blanchett this last decade. She has really come into her own as one of the best working actresses we have today. How she can convey so much with just the most minor of facial gestures or the way that she holds a glass or a cigarette is unparalleled. And Rooney Mara does so much acting in this film with literally just her eyes. If all you could see was her eyes in this movie, you would know exactly what she was feeling. It's the window to the soul, and we could see Rooney Mara bearing hers in this film. And together, their chemistry on screen, it crackles. It's just magnificent to watch. I love this film. It's got this wistful ability to lift you up like a leaf in the wind. It carries you along in this swooning romance. It is a travesty that Todd Haynes didn't get a Best Director nomination for Carol. This film is a work of art. All right, so moving on. Next up, we have one of the most thought-provoking, well-acted, and honestly, underappreciated sci-fi films of the last 10 years. It's Alex Garland's Ex Machina. Ex Machina tells the story of a computer programmer called Caleb, who's played by Domino Gleason, who is selected by his CEO boss, Nathan, who's played by Oscar Isaac, to travel to this remote, state-of-the-art home where Caleb is tasked with testing out a new artificial intelligence that Nathan has designed. A synthetic robot called Ava, who's played in this film by Alicia Vikander. This is a slow burn, dialogue heavy sci-fi, but it's rivetingly written. It poses some perplexing questions about AI and humanity. Ex Machina is such an enthralling watch because its trifecta of characters are ambiguously hard to read. You never quite know where you stand with them, which adds a lot of suspense because the motivations of the characters are quite murky, none more so than Oscar Isaac as Nathan. And Alicia Vikander is eerily graceful as Ava. The way that she moves, almost like a ballerina, it's almost too perfect to be human. I really appreciated Ex Machina. It's a beautifully shot film. It's intelligently written, it's stylish, it left me pondering the implications for weeks. The visual effects are jaw-droppingly real, and even though it is quite a slow film, I was engrossed from start to end. Okay guys, so that was 90 to 81. Be sure to share your thoughts and opinions about the list in that comment section down below. Hit that thumbs up button, and of course, if you haven't done so already, click subscribe so you don't miss the next vid. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I shall see you guys in the next one.